Great. So we Great. are going live. Okay, let's go. Yeah, and we are now live on Facebook. Good evening, everybody who are watching us live on Facebook this evening on Carvan's page. I am Ishan Sharma, founder of Carvan. And today with me, I have a very special guest, Professor Ritu Birla, joining us from New York. Professor Ritu Birla addresses capitalism and it's- But I'm not of... from Toronto, from Toronto, yeah. University of Toronto. Yeah. And she addresses capitalism and its forms of governing by bringing the study of the economy, law, and empire to current questions in culture and political theory. She is the author of a very famous book, a much widely uh, cited book, Stages of Capital, Law, Culture, and Market Governance in Late Colonial India that was published by the Duke University Press way back in 2009. And it was published in India by Orion Black Swan in two, uh, 2010. The book was the winner of the 2010 Albion Book Prize in British Studies, cited widely for its foundational analysis of colonial law on market and what she has called vernacular kinship-based capitalism. This text and her broader writings have charted the production of that modern abstraction we call the economy as an object of governance and as a name for the public as a, and as a model for social relations. Her recent researches have turned to processes of financialization, speculation, and neoliberal governance from the perspective of the history of empire. Other current projects reflect her ongoing work on the making of the modern self as market agent, global cultures of capitalism, and the circulation and translation of political and economic thought. She holds a tenured faculty position at the Department of History, University of Toronto, and she has also been the director Asian Institute at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs. And before that, she was also the director of the Asia, Asian Institute's subunit, the Center for South Asian Studies. She serves on the senior editorial board of the award-winning journal published by Duke University Press called the Public Culture. And she's also on the advisory board, editorial advisory board for Capitalism, a journal on history and economics published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. This lecture today is going to pose a long history of economic liberalization, connecting current cultures of capitalism with colonial histories of market governance. There are many parts of this genealogy. This presentation today will focus on the legal concept of charity, its relationship with profit making and its regulation. As Professor Birla have argued in the lecture that we are going to listen to, 19th century colonial law regulated the vernacular words of the bazaar by defining charity as a gift for general public utility to, to operate through the formal legal mechanism of the trust. Here, Professor Birla emphasizes that government, governmental transformation sought to institutionalize strict distinction between charitable giving and profit making, all the while placing I placing them in relation to each other in physical administration. In the nationalist and post-independence period, jurisprudence of charitable tax ex exemption began to, read practice, began to read practices of charity through the lens of profit making. Post-independence law reinterpreted colonial criteria for charitable activity, finding it into the practices of profit making this lecture explores these legal shifts into modern philanthropy, reflecting transformations in the social imagery that ungrid contemporary Indian neoliberal market society. So without further ado, I would formally invite Professor Birla to deliver today's Carvan special lecture. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It is a true honor to host you. Over to you, ma'am. Okay. Uh Ishan, thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you to Karvan. I just want to take a moment to applaud this initiative and the conversations, very diverse, important range of conversations that you're producing uh, at building this marriage between technology and critical humanities thinking. It's so important these days. And much congratulations and applause to you and your colleagues. Uh, you're just doing a fantastic job. It's most impressive. Um, so uh, uh, Ishan has just read uh, 
a rather dense abstract that I sent along uh, to Karvan. Uh, and let me just unpack it very briefly before I begin to formally lecture uh, to you. Um, so I'm interested today in the long history uh, genealogy from colonial market governance to contemporary Indian market society. And there are many ways in which to look at this history. I'm looking at it on the terrain of law and specifically through the lens of charity, the idea of charity and charitable giving. How does law regulate charitable giving? Well, a key theme that I'm going to follow all the way through this lecture is the relationship between charitable giving and profit making. And now we tend to think of these two things as completely different. And indeed, morally, we might want to. Uh, charitable giving is really giving and not as self-interested action. We tend to think of profit making as self-interested action. So what is interesting about this genealogy is that if we look at vernacular uh, mercantile groups in the 19th century and before, they have a very fluid relationship in their practices between charitable giving and profit making. And I will talk about that. I've written about that. Then you see the colonial state come in and draw a strict distinction definitionally between charity and profit. And this has to do with colonial governing. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, that is part of a process of what scholars have called economization, the remaking of society as a market. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then strangely, what happens is that even as the colonial state distinguishes between charity and profit making in law, it also links them. And it links them in a very, uh, 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 important tie, uh, a, a link that will uh, continue in a variety of incarnations, and that is a link between tax exemption and uh, profit making. So charity and, and profit become linked uh, at the site of tax exemption, fiscal administration. So these are the sort of factors at play at telling this story in the broader transition from colonial market governance to the contemporary. So since I don't have a PowerPoint and I'm doing this lecture in an informal or, uh, or rather a more formal way, <laughs> uh, I wanted to highlight these big points for you. So let me begin first with the Charitable Endowments Act of 1890. The first Charitable Endowments Act defined charitable purpose uh, as, quote, relief of the poor, education, medical relief, and the advancement of any other object of general public utility. And this phrase, general public utility, as Ishan highlighted, is key in understanding the colonial definition of charitable giving, the gift for general public utility. I've also written about this uh, in a variety of spaces, but I'm gonna really focus on that concept today. So the idea, this, uh, the act uh, of 1890 tied the idea of charity at the same time to newly minted taxation and fiscal procedure established in the first comprehensive Indian Income Tax Act of 1886. So 1886 and then 1890. Just over a century later, as evinced in India's new corporate social responsibility requirements mandated by the Indian Companies Act of 2013, giving for social welfare had become clearly legible as a function of profit making. So what is that genealogy? 1890 to say 2013, a long 20th century. CSR is now understood, according to the UNDP, I'm quoting here, a uh, as a management concept whereby companies integrate social and environmental concerns in their business operations and interactions with stakeholders. So in this long 20th century bookended by these developments, these different, uh, these different acts in the 19th century and the 20th, 
new governmental rationalities mapped charity through formal practices of accounting and fiscal procedure. These new fiscal techniques placed charitable giving and profit making on the same register by identifying charity through the criterion of tax exemption. So these colonial and then also nationalist processes produce broadly relevant anxieties about the very nature and possibility of charity in a market society. Indeed, Indian case law since the 1940s grappled with the question of whether the legal mechanisms for modern philanthropy, and that is the public trust, the public trust, the nonprofit society, the nonprofit company, whether these legal mechanisms, uh, whose endowments rely on a regular return of income to be distributed for charity, they asked, are these fundamentally inst instruments directed at profit making? Jurists were forced to ask if charitable endowments rely on profit making, whether through trade, through rental income, through return on investment, if you have an institution that's a trust and it's increasing in its endowment through investment, then does this fact fortify or undermine the ethics and practice of charity itself? If you have a charitable endowment that's making profit, what does that do to the moral concept of charity? Uh, let alone to the public distribution. So such ethical questions concerning the meaning of charity in market societies emerge from India's particular history of vernacular social gifting and the transformation in its legibility by colonial law and market governance. Um, now, I'll tell you a little bit about that vernacular context <clears throat> in a minute, but first let's ask, what do I mean by a market society? So it's a term that's tossed about. It's always good since you're students, I always like to get people to define their terms. So let's define our terms. So as I've argued elsewhere, uh, I refer here to the market as a super local imaginary for the free circulation of exchange in service of profit and as a template for all social relations. Colonial governance in the late 19th century mapped Indian society in this way as a market first and foremost. And that is one of the concerns is what does it mean to map all social relations as market relations first and foremost? There are many, many, many layers of meaning in social relations, obviously. So this process was followed by the nationalist developmental state and then economic liberalization by which uh, which by the turn of the 20th, uh, 21st century has been manifest in a celebration of Indian entrepreneurship and buttressing of new forms of corporate philanthropy described as social responsibility. So the Indian legal ethical angst over the relationship of charity and profit making is widely relevant for studying philanthropy in neoliberal settings broadly. And so I'm speaking of India and its particularities here, but the genealogy I'm presenting is part of a broader project on thinking about neoliberalism. Um, now, such questions demand that we examine modern philanthropy as a governmental rationality or governmentality as the philosopher Michel Foucault called it. Philanthropic governmentality selectively and expertly crochets non-market values and social imaginaries in concepts such as charity, dan, zakat, into contemporary market society. So to illustrate today, I'd like to continue some uh, uh, with outlining some overarching paths of 20th to 21st century Indian jurisprudence on the idea of charity as general public utility summarizing trends in a rich legal administrative archive on philanthropy. And I have two broad purposes here. First, to further explore the techniques by which practices of giving are folded into market logics. And second, to highlight transformations across liberal, post-independence and emergent neoliberal governmental rationalities. 
I'll highlight the legal confusions and infusions of definitions of charity and profit in India from the late 19th century through to liberalization, mapping new parameters and lines of inquiry for a genealogy of contemporary neoliberal market society. One that is understood to be constituted by entrepreneur citizens. In the process, I'd like to consider how the post-colonial regulation of charitable giving at once evinces a departure from the 19th century worldviews of vernacular capitalism, while also seeking to reanimate them in current iterations of corporate social responsibility. So in the subcontinent, the modern administration of charitable giving was coincident with the late colonial understanding of the market, uh, of the public rather, as market first and foremost. This mapping aggressively distinguished philanthropy from the vernacular value systems of the bazaar. In fact, modern philanthropy in India was at its inception informed by a British utilitarian governmental pragmatism. This utilitarian motivation in the colony contrasted with English jurisprudence, which acknowledged traditional concepts of charity. These were Christian concepts articulated in the foundational 1601 statute of Elizabeth, and they in fact continued to inform jurisprudence in the UK into the modern period. This English statute had identified charity through its vast colloquial meanings from care for individuals to support of local communities, identifying a range of moral acts that were meaningful exactly because they were not measurable in monetary terms. In contrast, colonial jurists in India assessed the practices of vernacular social welfare through a calculating utilitarian register. Customary bazaar practices were scrutinized because they appeared to colonial authorities to dangerously entangle charitable giving and profit-making endeavors. So among native merchant capitalists, benefits offered to the community through gifts for social welfare were not conceived as exclusive of benefits that might be enjoyed alongside by the family and the firm. So, as I've argued in detail in other places, the financial portfolios of vernacular mercantile endowments for social welfare could always be tapped for market and non-market values to defray the debt of the firm as well as to provide for a daughter's dowry. So just to give you a brief example, if you're a mercantile family firm, you may establish a dharamshala uh, in your local community. It may also uh, provide uh, um, food for the poor. If there is rental income on the stores in the Dhamshala, that income can be used for the charitable purpose uh, governed by the charitable social welfare institution. But that uh, profit, that rental income could also go back to the family for a temporary period if the firm needed to defray debt or if a daughter is getting married, or if there's an elder person who needs care, that those funds would always, always return back to the charitable endowment. But there was a fluidity there that is something that colonial administrators had difficulty dealing with and they wanted to fix. So uh, these loans, uh, that mercantile uh, groups would uh, extract from their own charitable endowments would always be returned to the endowments. This reflects these firms' multiple capacities as banking operations, families, as well as being charitable donors. So colonial authorities, as I said, found it difficult to fix and measure the relationship of profit-making and charitable activity in vernacular practices. Moreover, vernacular capitalists chose generally to give to local communities in which they were familiar, rather than to an abstract general public as in general public utility, constituted by communities with which they would never interact. 
So these difficulties provide the impetus for presenting transformations in governmental policy that I'm outlining now. To build on established research on colonial governmentality and its regimes of calculability, addressing recent scholarship on processes of economization is also helpful. So I just want to define again, economization refers broadly to the making of arenas and relationships as calculable, even monetizable, that is as economies first and foremost. As such, the legal mapping I want to outline today charts the making of charity as a function of profit. How can we chart the economization of charity from a moral arena to an accounting category? That is, how is charity, the ethical idea of giving without expectation of return, understood through the lens of profit making and the very expectation of return? as what is now called tax exemption. How are the traditional concepts of charity reincarnated in modern nonprofit philanthropy? So to illustrate and launch such a genealogy, I will highlight significant moments in 20th century jurisprudence on the meaning of charity as general public utility, highlighting some precedent setting cases. These jurisprudential debates emerge from the legal history of the trust. And the trust is important here. It is a mechanism which establishes, a legal mechanism, which establishes a tripartite donation, a tripartite relation, sorry, of donor, trustee, who legally manages the trust funds, and beneficiary, who benefits from the trust funds, donor, trustee, and beneficiary. The trust relation governs gifts for the public as a collective beneficiary. This is what colonial law institutes. These uh, uh, are considered charitable gifts to the public. They're considered charitable in law and so tax exempt. The customary bizarre practices that enabled flows of funds from social welfare mm -hmm. to profitable endeavors and back again were regulated through the introduction of the legal mechanism of the trust for general public utility. The 19th century distinction between public gifts and private interests institutionalized in the trust established a strict distinction between profitable and charitable activity. So colonial law on charity sought to establish a rigid boundary between self-oriented, that is profit-seeking activity and other oriented or altruistic action. This was a legal abstracting of market relations out of what were perceived as the fluid and messy vernacular capitalist contexts of gain and giving. But at the same time, colonial governmental techniques which distinguished profit and charity also enmeshed them in ways that ultimately fortified the social imaginaries of contemporary market society. Charity becomes read through tax exemption the calculation of profit, and so as a problem of the distribution of profit. Therefore, we must also pay attention to the tensions between the juridical logic of colonial and then national sovereignty, which institutionalizes the, institutionalizes the distinction between charity and property, uh, between charity and profit via the public trust. So you have juridical and national sovereignty seeking to institutionalize the distinction between charity and profit by the public trust on the one hand. And then you have on the other hand, the imperatives of fiscal administration that seek to render charity legible via profit. So distinguishing them, but also rendering charity legible via profit. So how does this happen? Well, uh, this uh, section of the lecture is uh, subtitled Economization and Charitable Intention. Intentionality is very important in law. So before delving into jurisprudence, it's worth outlining briefly how colonial and uh, post-colonial history on philanthropy contributes to a broader discussions on economization and to the study of liberal governmentality. 
Uh, the formalization of charitable giving in India was integral to the broader process of the production of the abstract super local arena that we now call the economy. This extensive elaboration of legal governmental institutions to support free trade's invisible hand also produced a complex jurisprudence on categories of property that could be held outside of commercial circulation, valuation, and profit making. Thus, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, in Anglo and American legal thought, the exception that enabled the general rule of profit making through the free circulation of capital was the category of the gift the gift to be maintained extra commercium, that is outside of circulation, outside of commerce. However, since all gifts were also bundles of capital that could produce profit, the law asserted that it was the original charitable intention of a gift that had to be protected and could not revert to a profitable intention. Recent theorizing of econ economization also emphasizes how we must pay attention to how the economy or economic behavior are defined by modern technologies as distinct from older value systems. So colonial sites can help to foreground such politics of economization. For example, the classification of some vernacular practices as simply enacting ritual, cultural or religious norms, and so as non-market activity or informal activity. Uh, and in other cases, you see even the direct criminalization of such marginalized conventions. So the story of charity and its legal regulation in India is an especially rich ground for detailing processes of economization exactly because colonial governing established new configurations of gift giving in its novel and abstract geography of market exchange. At first, it seems that colonial law in the late 19th century was invested only in an ideal understanding of the gift as one directional. The gift was to be given to the beneficiary via the enforcement of the trust mechanism. The donor could not retrieve the gift or any part of it. Thus, for 19th century colonial jurists responding to vernacular worldviews and practices, charity's moral value lay in the fact that it stood outside calculable relations of exchange, extra commercium. Nevertheless, unlike vernacular worlds, colonial authorities at the very same time defined charity via utility a concept that from utilitarian political economy to marginalist neoclassical economics understood value through market exchange and so as clearly calculable. We might say that in this way, the late 19th century saw an arranged marriage between a feminized affective ethics of charity, charity as compassion, as sympathy, and a masculinized ethos of profit, of rational calculation. Uh, an arranged marriage in which charity could not be thought of without reference to profit. These developments also highlight tensions in India's liberal governmentality. These are tensions between economic liberalism and its buttressing of market sovereignty and political liberalism and its buttressing of the state's administrative authority. So let's turn to tax law now and the changing definition of char char charitable exemption. The arranged marriage between profit and charity, we might say, is rendered sacred in tax law's delineations of charitable exemptions. It's important to note that <clears throat> the first Indian Income Tax Act of 1886 preceded the Charitable Endowments Act by four years and incorporated a measure for a tax exemption for gifts for quote, public charitable purposes. But the 1886 definition of that category remained vague. And then in 1890, the Charitable Endowments Act uh, codified two decades of jurisprudence on vernacular endowments. 
And this occurred only after tax law had substantially expanded fiscal administration for accounting. The distinction between charitable and profitable intention that structured the 1890 legal definition of charity as the gift for general public utility came into crisis in case law after the first major revision of the 1886 Indian Income Tax Act, and that occurred in 1922. So the 1922 Indian Income Tax Act fortified the administrative structure for the collection and enumeration of accounts and was motivated by vernacular capitalism's extensive speculative gains and entry into industry during the First World War. It thus combined measures for income tax and also the super tax on high profits for companies and family firms while also elaborating on the kinds of incomes that would not be subject to tax, including, for example, interest on securities held by provident funds and other forms of mutual association. Most significantly, it revised the 1886 Indian Income Tax Act by fine tuning the stipulations for tax exemption. So section 215 of the 1922 Indian Income Tax Act thus stated, and I'm quoting, quote, charitable purpose includes relief of the poor, education, medical relief, and the advancement of any other form of general public utility. Now this was a slightly revised iteration of the 1886 Act, which had said, the advancement of any other object of general public utility. 1922 says the advancement of any other form of general public utility. So this criterion, the advancement of any other form of general public utility is now formally incorporated into tax law. The broad phrasing of this stipulation and the imagining of forms or activities for and not just objects of general public utility emerged as the linchpin of Indian jurisprudence on the meaning of charity through the rest of the 20th century. The key issue that appeared again and again in precedent setting cases concerned the meaning, extent, and expanse of the term general public utility. This question dominated Indian jurisprudence in a way that it never could in Britain. In India, the 1890 Charitable Endowments Act had deployed the term, as I've said, general public utility, instituting a much wider statutory definition of charity than in the UK. In the UK, by contrast, the idea of everyday forms of charity that had informed case law since the 1601 statute of Elizabeth emphasized that not every activity for general public utility could be considered charitable. The clearest example was trade, which could count as general public utility, but not necessarily a charitable activity. In Britain, a precedent setting case in 1896 in the Court of Chancery clearly warned against the term general public utility being deployed as a universal criterion for charitable activity. And I'm quoting, quote, not every object of general public utility must necessarily be charitable. Some may be and some may not be. That was Britain. But this was not the case in India, where colonial utilitarian governing techniques had clearly defined charity and the criterion for charitable tax exemption as the gift for general public utility. So now let me turn to some specific case law to hopefully illustrate uh, this kind of broader, more abstract uh, um, set of questions and transitions uh, that I've just highlighted. So this section I'm calling from Kadi to Chambers of Commerce. And the question here is, is trade a form of general public utility? And if so, is trade charity? So the question of the legal governmental versus colloquial understandings of charity and the extent and limits of the term general public utility as an object and an activity emerged as a powerful politically charged topic of clarification in the 1940s. 
1941, the All India Spinners Association, an organization formed in 1925 under the All India Congress Committee, specifically to promote Khadi trade, trade in hand woven cloth, and then officially registered in 1937 as an association, came under scrutiny of the Revenue Department. The Bombay Commissioner of Income Tax reviewed its accounts from 1935 and claimed that at the time, the association was unregistered and that its income resulted from a clear purpose, earning profit. According to a document that defined the association's purpose, its goals were to cultivate hand spinning, to provide jatkas and hand looms to poor families, education in hand spinning, and to open khadar stores. The spinning wheels were bought with donations to the AICC and then given to families. So as summarized by the Bombay High Court from evidence presented to it, the association represented a system of business in which both hand spun yarn and the cloth sold as khadi provided wages to laborers. So the question of profit on khadi sales arose in, in the 1936 accounting year, when the association decided to increase the wages of the weavers and so charged more for hand spun cloth. Uh, however, the workers that had produced that cloth had not initially been forwarded any, high, forwarded any higher wages. These were to be dispensed from the profit on the sale of goods at the increased price. So this situation opened a compelling legal question. Was Khadi the potent economic performative of Congress's popular nationalism and Gandhian idiom of collective ethical and political uplift? Was Khadi to be understood as trade for profit and so taxable? As Chief Justice Beaumont of the High Court asked, had the association, quote, made a profit, and if so, the question is whether such profit is derived from property held under trust or other legal obligation for religious or charitable purposes. By posing the question in this way, the Bombay High Court equivocated, arguing that the association had indeed made a profit, but that the key issue was fundamentally a matter of whether the association was a trust. For if it were, the profitable activities would be understood as simply incidental to the purpose of the trust, which was relief and education of the poor and the public in general. Reviewing the association's legal formation, the court decided that there was no deed of trust for the year 1936, as it had not been formally uh, registered until 1937. The court decided there was no deed of trust for the year 1936, and so the All India Spinners Association should be assessed as subject to tax. Not surprisingly, in this moment of accelerated nationalist momentum, the All India Spinners Association appealed. The case went all the way up to the Privy Council in 1944. Uh, perhaps recognizing the insult of casting Khadi, a symbol of nationalist political economy, Gandhian ethics, and the collective project of Swaraj as mere profit making, the Privy Council overturned the earlier Bombay High Court decision. The thrust of the Privy Council judgment was that while the Spinners Association had not been formally constituted as a trust, the regularity and formality of its procedures, rules, and accounting allowed it to be legally understood as such. The case was significant not only for its symbolic value, but also because it set the stage for two seemingly opposing trends. First, the project of clearly distinguishing profit-making from charitable activity. And second, for reading the promotion of trade and possibly trade itself as general public utility and so as charity. This jurisprudential trend was elaborated in a key Madras High Court case in 1961. At that time, the new socialist, capitalist, developmentalist nation state furthered this 1944 Privy Council precedent in Andhra Chamber of Commerce v. Commissioner of Income Tax. That's February 1961. 
Following the 1944 precedent, this case highlighted the problem of distinguishing between what counted as publicly directed charitable activity and what counted as private profit incentivized activity. This quandary evinced tensions between India's and the Indian nation's long held claims to economic sovereignty this would actually justify an understanding of trade as general public utility, India's claims to economic sovereignty, and the extractive claims of the Indian state's fiscal administration. So this was a tension between the juridical definition of charity as general public utility and the fiscal imperative of taxation of profit. Working through this tension, jurisprudence and administration slowly folded profit making into the legal definition of charity. The Andhra Chamber of Commerce case in 1961 was a key moment in this process. The chamber had been established under Section 26 of the Indian Companies Act of 1913. Uh, this section actually repeated the same section of the original 1882 Indian Companies Act. Uh, and it allowed for the incorporation of not-for-profit companies, such as chambers of commerce, whose incomes were to be spent, quote, solely on the promotion of their specified objects and not distributed as dividend to its members. Such income would be tax exempt as charitable purpose under the 1922 Indian Income Tax Act. Now, in this case, the Andhra Chamber of Commerce had income from the years 1947 to 53 from property that it owned and rented. The net income from its buildings was assessed to tax under Section 9 of the 1922 Income Tax Act, which covered income from property. The chamber contested, and the case went to the Income Tax Tribunal, which agreed with the Revenue Department. At this point, the case moved to the Madras High Court, which was asked to consider whether the income should have been exempt given the primary purpose of the chamber, which as per its memorandum of association was to promote and protect trade in the province of Madras in India and to promote the interests of Andhra trade uh, more broadly in commerce and industry. The court also highlighted that the chamber submitted a claim that its quote, earnest desire was to set up a commercial and industrial museum, to arrange to send trade delegations to various countries for the promotion of India's trade relations, to institute scientific and technical research and organize commercial intelligence on a larger, larger scale. So the key question for the Madras High Court was whether the objects outlined here could pass the test of the charitable purpose section of the 1922 Income Tax Act. Did these objects qualify as the advancement of any other form of general public utility? The court's judgment explained that, quote, it might at first sight appear to be a startling claim that a trade association like the Assessi, the Andhra Chamber, that a trade association is a charitable institution or a charitable organization. It is not, however, the popular concept of what constitute charity, constitutes charity that matters. So the conduct of profit making, i.e. renting buildings, was deemed incidental to the broader charitable purpose of the organization. But the broader charitable purpose of the organization was the promotion of trade. This seemed to blur the distinction between charitable and profit making activities. Here, the judiciary spoke in the voice of the nation as national economy, emphasizing that trade could be interpreted as an object of general public utility and also as the form or medium for the promotion of general public utility. So let's turn to the 1960s and 70s where these trends that seem to be indicating that trade might even be understood, at least the promotion of trade, but trade itself might be understood as general public utility. What happens in the 60s and 70s? We begin to see a regulation 
of profit making and a reactivation of the idea of charity and its relationship to profit making. So the Andhra Chamber of Commerce judgment was presented in February of 1961. It marked an emergent battle between the judiciary and the parliament. For at the very same time, the Lok Sabha was framing a major revision to the 1922 Income Tax Act, the Indian Income Tax Act of 1961, which came into force on April 1st, 1962. Now, in it, the definition of charity was once again fine-tuned. This time specifically articulated in reference to profit making and as distinct from profit making or trade. So a, a real turnaround, you have jurisprudence moving in the direction of connecting charity and pro profit making and then legislation turning that around. So section 215 of uh, the Indian Income Tax Act of 1961 stated that quote, charitable purpose includes relief of the poor, education, medical relief, and the advancement of any other object of general public utility not involving the carrying on of any activity for profit. And that is a quote, the advancement of any other object of general public utility not involving the carrying on of any activity for profit. These transformative few words went strictly against judicial precedent and fortified the state's fiscal reach to tax. This move reflected what uh, Lloyd and Susan Rudolph identified in their now classic analysis of India's post-colonial political economy as a struggle between judicial review and parliamentary authority. The insertion of the new phrase in the 1961 version of the Indian Income Tax Act asserted both a strong sovereignty and a governmental interest in regulating markets. From the perspective of what I would call the governmentalization of charity, it seems that the judiciary was supporting an economic liberalism, understanding trade as general public utility, or at least the promotion of trade as general public utility. And the parliament speaking in the name of political liberalism and citizenship sought to fortify executive authority over the extraction of revenue to serve the citizenry. Under Indira Gandhi, two significant Supreme Court's court cases, both with judgments in 1975, ensued after this significant statutory change. These cases reversed the precedence of the Spinners Association and the Andhra Chamber of Commerce case, which had understood the activities of trade, including profit making, as servicing the purpose of general public utility. So in the interest of time, I will not elaborate here on the legal details of these 1975 cases, but suffice it to say that the first 1975 case concerned a trust that sold newspapers in the Kannada language for the purpose of education, and the second concerned the Indian Chamber of Commerce and income tax assessment. The judgment in the latter summarizes the jurisprudential trends. The justices argued that the legal definition of charity as general public utility had offered opportunities to cultivate, quote, a crop of camouflaged organizations whose, quote, mask was charitable, but whose heart was hunger for tax-free profit. Charitable purposes, they argued, should not enable profit making. We see here how much things have changed by the contemporary neoliberal period, where strategic philanthropy in CSR, corporate social responsibility, is celebrated to enable profit. So maybe we can step back and think about building a genealogy of economic liberalization, a long genealogy. And to do this, thinking about profit making as a medium for charitable giving or charity as a medium for profit making. So what happens after the 1970s that would bring us to CSR today? Despite the compelling rhetoric of the 1975 Supreme Court cases that rigorously distinguished charitable activity from that of profit making, shortly thereafter, two new cases came to the Indian Supreme Court. 
challenging both 1975 decisions and calling for a return to earlier precedent. The first, Additional Commissioner of Income Tax Gujarat versus Surat Silk Art Cloth Manufacturers Association in 1979, was a weighty decision chock full of jurisprudential hermeneutics that reflected the oscillation in precedence on charity as general public utility. Surat Silk was an incorporated company and carried on various activities for the promotion of commerce and trade in art silk yarn, cloth and silk cloth. It also obtained licenses for the import of raw material, as well as licenses for the export of cloth manufactured by its members. Just as we may think of silk art manufacturing as a more delicate version of Kadi, the Surat Silk Art Manufacturers Association case offered a more precise spin of the All India Spinners Association case. According to Surat Silk's Memorandum of Association, its income and property were to be applied solely for the promotion of its objects with no dividends or bonus returned to its members. And in the event of its dissolution, its assets were to be transferred to another company for similar purposes. Today, this association will be called Nonprofit Corporation. In 1979, the association claimed tax exemption under Section 11.1 of the 1961 Indian Income Tax Act, which allowed companies to exempt portions of income that comply with the definition of charitable purpose. This claim to exemption was rejected by the income tax officer on the grounds that none of the association's objects were charitable within the meaning of section 215, which is the charitable purpose section. On the other hand, the appellate assistant commissioner held that Surat Silk's income was entitled to exemption exactly because its activities did not involve the carrying on of any activity for profit. The appellate tribunal in appeal affirmed the second opinion. The Supreme Court had therefore to adjudicate on the specific meaning of the final phrase in the 1961 Income Tax Act definition of charitable purpose. I'll repeat it. Quote, the advancement of any other object of general public utility not involving the carrying on of any activity for profit. The court decided that an instruction, uh, an institution could be categorized as charitable as long as its purpose or intent did not involve profit making. However, the means by which that charitable end was achieved, the advancement of that end, could include profit making. So fine tuning and specifically articulating the implications of the 1944 All India Spinners Association and the 1961 Andhra Chamber of Commerce precedents, the Supreme Court in 1979 posed profit making as incidental to charitable activity. The conduct of profit making could be distinguished from the intention of profit making. As such, the conduct of profit making could fuel charitable purposes. So one can set up a charitable endowment and that endowment can be invested in the stock market. That's a profit making activity, but as long as the profits from those investments are directed at the charitable intention for which the endowment was established, that's absolutely fine. So that's generally the model that we, we understand today. <clears throat> the proto-liberalization tendencies of this judicial activism were fortified by another case shortly thereafter, a powerful reversal of the 1975 Indian Chambers of Commerce de decision. This reversal stemmed from a series of appeals by the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FICI. Reiterating the majority opinion in the Surat Silk Art Manufacturers case in favor of FICI, in 1981, the Supreme Court held that, and I quote, there is a distinction between the purpose of a trust and the power conferred upon the trustees as incidental to carrying out the purpose. If the primary or dominant purpose of a trust or institute is charitable, any other object which is merely ancillary or incidental to the primary or dominant purpose would not prevent the trust or the institution being a valid charity. 
The force of this decision was later validated in law by the 1984 Finance Act, which removed the words not involving the carrying on of any activity for profit from Section 215 of the Indian Income Tax Act. By the time of liberalization in the 1990s, jurisprudence had confirmed that the conduct of profit making could fuel charitable activity. Placed on the fiscal accounting ledger, charity was folded into market logics and was transforming into philanthropic strategy. So to conclude, I want to think about earlier forms of vernacular giving and corporate social responsibility in light of this kind of summary genealogy I've given you. The Indian case law genealogy I've highlighted here informs the framing of India as a liberalized market society. How might we understand the governmentality of the legal mechanism of the trust for general public utility and that of philanthropy more generally? The CSR regulations of the 2013 Indian Companies Act and a recent case in the Indian Income Tax Appellate Tribunal Kolkata in December 2014, citing the precedent of the 1981 FICI decision, offer initial approaches. This recent 2014 case concerned again the Indian Chamber of Commerce. In it, the ICC sought to reverse its own earlier admission to the assessment officer that its activities were profit-making activities, that its activities in conducting, quote, environment management centers, meetings, conferences, and seminars were profit-making activities. So it now wants to reverse this decision after the 2013 CSR rules. And in its appeal, it cites the 1979 Surat Silk Art Manufacturers and the 1981 Vicky Supreme Court cases, emphasizing that the objects of the Indian Chamber of Commerce have been since its inception in 1925 to advance trade, general public utility, and so charitable purposes. Significantly, the Chamber elaborated on the role of the Environment Management Center it had established, arguing that the Center sought to, quote, promote environment management for enhancing competitiveness and efficiency in business and industry in order to ensure a cleaner, safer, and healthier environment for the society at large. The appellate tribunal supported the case and reversed the earlier decision. So it emphasized that the Indian Chamber of Commerce activities were directed at, quote, implementing effective energy conservation practices, managing environmental hazards, and mitigating risks. And so containing, quote, damage to the environment done by unregulated, ill, and informal industries. Thus, charitable purpose was economized for benefit to the public now translated here as managing environments of business, ecological or otherwise, by creating a safer society and managing risk. Charity here has become a function of profit. If jurisprudence in the 20th century emphasized that the conduct of profit making can fuel charity, under CSR's worldview, the conduct of charitable giving can fuel profit. The new CSR rules outlined in section 135 of the 2013 Act reflect this marketized worldview. They are applicable to companies that have an annual turnover of rupees 1,000 crore or more, a net worth of rupees 500 crore or more, a net profit of rupees 5 crore or more. These companies are mandated to constitute a CSR committee of three or more directors and set aside at least 2% of their average profit over the previous three years for CSR. The law enumerates a wide range of CSR activities, including the promotion of education, gender equity, and women's development, combating disease, child mortality and extreme uh, poverty, uh, uh, contr contributions to central funds, social business projects, environmental sustainability, and vocational skills. Corporations are thus directed to address much of the portfolio of the old developmental estate. But at the same time, and significantly, companies are now to give preference to local areas when formulating CSR policies. 
As such, the new rules seem to evoke an ethos of customary social welfare practices directed not at the abstract public of citizens, the public of general public utility, but rather in cultivating local communities. For example, a recent CSR study of CSR activities in 2012 to 13, the year just before the passage of the act, found that most firms, quote, undertake CSR expenditure for the welfare of rural communities, especially around their areas of operation. A possible reason could be to generate goodwill amongst people in the neighborhood and become familiar with the area and its needs, which in turn would minimize costs of providing services. With this interest in giving to familiar local communities, have we returned then to the vernacular market ethics of the 19th century and before? I think to say so would be to ignore the epistemological and institutional transformations of philanthropic governmentality, which has folded the layered value systems of conventional forms of charitable giving into philanthropy and now philanthropy into corporate social responsibility. Indeed, we might say that the social welfare practices of 19th century vernacular capitalism have been economized into the calculable intentionality that is the strategic deployment of the net profits of the corporate person. So from human charity, we have the charity of the corporate person. Uh, so I'll leave, I'll leave uh, you with that thought and um, uh, turn back to Ishan. Thank, Thank you so you. much, ma'am, for delivering this lecture. It was truly amazing to you know, listen to you on such a rare topic, which is not in the mainstream history uh, syllabus in India, especially. And the relation between profit and charity that you explained very beautifully in the lecture is in. I was making note throughout the uh, throughout the lecture, and uh, you know my 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 notebook is quite messy right now. I've I've made some questions for you. Another aspect of the of the discussion that we didn't touch upon today was the medical modern institutionalized medical philanthropy in the colonial hmm. India. Can you can you briefly yeah. talk about that? Medical philanthropy. So do you mean Ayurveda? Yeah, probably. We, we can talk about that as well. I mean, what do you mean by medical philanthropy? Uh, like uh, in, the, in the British uh, times, there were people who, you know, uh, institutionalized uh, philanthropy to medicine and, and, and things like that. Like there was a hospital built in Bombay by merchants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is the Jamshed JJ Bhai uh, Hospital in in Bombay. So, can you talk about that and what impact philanthropy had, especially on the merchant class? If we can add on to that. So, uh, what happens in the nineteenth century is interesting, and the medical uh, arena is, I think, a very important one at which I have not studied in 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 serious detail. I haven't looked at those particular institutions, but in the nineteenth century, we have. Uh, different forms of charitable giving existing alongside each other. So the vernacular uh, practices that I was looking at were particularly those very traditional practices of the bazaar. So, and those institutions. Uh, JJ Hospital and other such institutions that, uh, that you highlight, these represent the emergence of modern philanthropic forms. Uh, and so what we see in the late 19th century is uh, both of these kinds of forms, more customary forms, as well as the more modern forms, we also have educational institutions. Uh, we have uh, Banaras Hindu University. We have more formal educational institutions, of course, also being established at this time, late 19th century, early 20th century. But it's actually for this reason that I think looking at the law and the confusions in law about what charity is, um, is so important. Uh, because these uh, informal, as they're called, forms of charitable giving exist alongside these more what we associate with more modern formal institutional philanthropies like uh, or philanthropic giving that establish 
uh, universities and hospitals. So they exist alongside each other. And I would go so far as to say that they continue to exist alongside each other. So the question of how they're regulated becomes all the more important. Um, and the question of how uh, people who deploy the language of charity use the idea of charity today is also very important. Uh, how is the language of charity marketized? How is the language of charity culturalized in a way that we, uh, we distinguish certain acts as simply uh, moral acts or at least claim to be moral acts uh, and others as acts that will allow for the benefit of the giver as well as the benefit uh, of the receiver uh, acts that are generally monetized if, if that makes sense yes yes <laughs> definitely and uh Talking about that and coming to the period of industrialization that happened after that, you know, the period of industrialization, did, did the period of industrialization also saw a change in, in the causes of philanthropy in India? For the cause of philanthropy or the charity was given earlier, was there a change in that? Absolutely. I think what you see in the industrial period and obviously after independence is a settling in of this idea of a general abstract public. That is, after all, what the nation is. It is an abstract public. You're not going to know intimately or personally everybody in the nation like you will uh, know everybody in your uh, particular uh, neighborhood or uh, local community. Um, so the idea of an of abstract giving is is absolutely institutionalized and that the the um the precedents uh particularly in the 60s and the 70s that i'm highlighting really emphasize that idea of an abstract public but what i want to do here is really think about the ways in which this idea of an abstract public which is understood as a public in the nationalist context in the post-independence context as a public of citizens is also at the same time slowly becoming a public of economic actors. And we tend to think in nationalist discourse of the public as a public of citizens. But if we're going to understand India's liberalization as not something that came out of the blue in 1991, under Manmohan Singh, or maybe even begun under, under Rajiv Gandhi. If we want to think of a longer history, then we have to understand that there's actually a longer history by which the Indian public itself is defined as a group of economic actors, of entrepreneur citizens. Now, whether one likes that or not is a different set of questions. I'm highlighting the question of how one can think of political citizenship as really, it's generally the dominant way in which we think of the public, we think of the nationalist movement, the anti-colonial movement, but at the same time there is, and you can see this in the law, this quiet redefinition of that public as a market, as a group of economic actors. Now, what does that do and how does that influence how we think of India today? Do we think of ourselves primarily in India as citizens today? Or do we think of ourselves primarily as entrepreneurs with our next, uh, you know, our next innovative Instagram post and, you know, new company? What's the relationship between them? Actually, it's your generation. It's your generation, I think, that has this dilemma most of all. Yes, and and we we come back to the industrialization. We'll come back to the liberalization part. You mentioned about the freedom struggle, and I think charity also played a great role in the independence struggle. Many royalties paid, you know, did charity to uh, for the for the Muslim League or the Indian National Congress at that point yes. of time. Yes. So I think that 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 is an interesting uh, I think point to for research for many students who are watching us live today. And before talking about the liberalization of 90s and the impact of it on philanthropy and socioeconomic development, 
uh, I would like to ask you about the advent of international agencies in the 50s when US was helping the newly independent countries with, with philanthropy and charity. So they became a new player in the in the new voluntary sector Absolutely. of Indian economy. Can you talk about that a bit? Absolutely. I think that's an excellent question. And the question of development aid, but also uh, nonprofit organizations, the Rockefeller Foundation, and I'll give away that my very first job, well, one of my first jobs was at the Ford Foundation in the urban poverty program when I was a real butcha um, before I went to graduate school. And actually, part of my interest in studying philanthropy was from my experience there because uh, at the time there was a question circulating around nonprofits. And the question was, why is there not more philanthropic giving in India, right? And now from my own personal experience in India, I knew there was a great deal of charity and giving, not just historically at things like universities and hospitals as you have highlighted, but even you know, in everyday activity. So this strange question coming from, from Western benevolent, benevolence is there, is, is the name of the game, benevolent uh, actors, why is there not more philanthropy? To me, exposed a real um, challenge of cultural translation. Um, so uh, I think that is a source, it's something that really must be studied. And what, I mean, there are, uh, there's a great new range of research now in international relations, looking at uh, um, these development agencies and the role of nonprofits and international uh, funding in the post Bretton Woods international arena in terms of governance. Um, the ways in which charitable giving actually fuels global uh, profit making might be another way to think about the, that post Bretton Woods structure that doesn't actually kind of uh, undo itself uh, until uh, the 1980s, I mean, after, after, uh, after uh, the, the floating of currencies. Then you can really start thinking about what charity means in a world where uh, um, we are speaking of completely floating currencies. Then you can talk about charity in the context of the currency of the US dollar reserve. And today, which is really mind blowing, we can talk about what does charity mean in the, in the context of Bitcoin and digital currency. When you, know, you can transfer funds in a millisecond um, uh, you can uh, uh, create a, a do GoFundMe page. So GoFundMe is that charity? I mean, does that does that is that Don? Is that Zakat? Is that? I mean, maybe it is. Maybe it's transforming. Uh, charity as in as 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 monetizable. Uh, as hyper monetizable, um, does that actually further charity as an ethical project or does it restrict it? And you're right to ask the question back to the 1950s and the question of benevolence and charitable giving of international aid institutions. What kinds of market structures do they support? And here you can look at the radical critique of that. The, the best reading of that is Kalyan, uh, 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 is, is, is um, uh, the economist, uh, oh my God, I've lost it. Um, uh, uh, the idea that philanthropy actually fuels capitalist governing, right? Uh, it fuels uh, forms, it, it doesn't, uh, produce social justice, it actually fuels forms of capitalist governing. That's one way we can think. The more neoliberal way of thinking is that uh, you create more wealth and, uh, and then those who have a great deal of wealth can give more wealth like Bill Gates. That's for you students to, to decide, you know, what, what is charitable and what is not, but this is the legal ground for it. 
Yeah, so the final it's question... Kal sorry, Kalyan Sanyal. I, I really, I'm an old person. I'm lost my mind. Kalyan Sanyal does the, does the radical critique of thinking about, uh, about this government aid and philanthropy is actually really fueling uh, uh, hierarchies, global hierarchies, uh, as well as within, within India. Yeah, I think people can go and uh, get the papers online of Kalyan. Yeah. And, and the final question, I think the defining question for the night, the last question for tonight is, do you agree, keeping aside the view that charities can also be seen as profit making for corporate body today, do you agree with the view that economic liberalization of 90s and consequent uh, redefinition, re, re, redefinition of the scope and range of state welfare across the region has lent a new impetus and significance to organize form of charitable and philanthropic activities that has resulted in socio-economic development in the country? Such a good question and such a complicated question. Um, so the first, uh, the first response would be, how do you define, you know, unati? How do you define development? How do you define development? So if you define development as getting computers into schools uh, so that kids can have technical education uh, and they can become entrepreneurs quickly uh, and then India can be competitive in the world economy, uh, then uh, I would certainly uh, applaud uh, the channeling of funds in that way. At the same time, uh, from a critical historian's perspective, one also has to think about strategic philanthropy and what kind of worldview it serves. So, uh, for example, in schools uh, in India, and I've learned here from my own teachers, uh, Guy through Spivak being one of them, that the at the lowest of the low level, students are taught really, and you can understand this probably, uh, that, that learning is memorizing, it's not critical thinking. And so uh, establishing schools where learning is memorizing so that you can become robots in the world economy, I don't, uh, is, that, is that what charitable purpose should do? Uh, perhaps charity should be teaching, uh, uh, producing new kinds of ways of thinking, say, for example, across the humanities and the social sciences. So, um, uh, you know, your question really begs another question, which is, what is development? And um, uh, the rush to monetize charity in service of what we call development, we've had almost uh, 80 years of that, uh, more actually, uh, you can see that development, and this is an argument made by many historians, development really starts as a concept in the colonial context in order to make sure that India remains profitable after 1857. So uh, uh, perhaps we have to ask ourselves what development is first. Uh, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't strategically monetize <laughs> development. We, shouldn't, we should absolutely establish hospitals and institutions like, uh, for education, um, research. Uh, but the, the relationship between uh, the funding practices and uh, the question of profit making and its uh, healthy manifestations shouldn't leave our view. I think one of the things we can do, and I tried to highlight in this lecture, is that when we have an accounting register, I, 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 you know, it's almost tax time now, right? When we have an accounting register, you're just filling in numbers, but you're not really thinking uh, possibly in more robust worldviews. So trying to get us maybe to remember the numbers, but when you write a check to an institution and think I've done good, but then really you're just 
living your life, we have to ask about the ethics as well as the, the, the politics uh, of that giving, if that makes sense. I think you, you have raised a very important point. And uh, do you think institutional uh, regulation of charity would help in this case? Regulating charity and, and philanthropy in India by the government? For well, I think, I think one should always have a rule of law. So regulating is a, always a very good thing because we certainly don't want um, we certainly don't want to have uh, uh, situations where people are giving money only for their it, to reduce their taxable income. Um, and but that and that is literally uh, the case uh, I I just cited in 1975. The Supreme Court case was very concerned about that. Um, uh, so. What I wanted to highlight in this in this lecture was that we have that precedent, um, but we also have a whole series of other precedents. So it does become complicated. Um, regulation is important. Rule of law is important policy-wise. Um, I also think that uh, in a um, at an intellectual level, I think it would be important for us to think about the relationship between philanthropy as a form of channeling funds and the broader ground for our understanding of charity as an ethical practice. Um, and so this is maybe a Gandhian intervention, okay? But you know, one of the things that made Gandhi so successful, and again, there are people in the audience that will hate Gandhi, there are people that love Gandhi and ev everyone in between. But what one can say is that the thing that made him, one of the things that made him so successful was that he understood that you begin with ethics and then you move into politics. So that's Swaraj, right? We govern ourselves, literally ourselves, and then we can have political independence. So similarly, I think with charity, one has to ask oneself um, about uh, one's own ethical practice, even as one is, of course, complicit. We have to be. We live in a capitalist world as one, if one is going to be giving to charitable institutions, when one is already going to be complicit in a certain kind of, of, of uh, um, philanthropic uh, logic, come capitalist logic. So uh, one might start there uh, in terms of uh, practices. It's a bit of an idealistic answer, but I'm not, I'm not making a policy recommendation here today. <laughs> Yes, and thank you so much, ma'am, for, for delivering today's lecture, for uh, answering all the questions and queries. It was truly an honor to be in a conversation with you, and, and I think it was one of the best lectures that we had on our platform, truly, on, on very, such rare topic. That's very kind of you. I, I, uh, I hope that I've at least opened up some questions of thinking in another uh, situation I can offer some policy interventions, but I didn't want this to be a policy lecture. I wanted this to be a, a thought provoking lecture for, for since I was talking mostly to students uh, and not to policy wonks. <laughs> I'll let you guys and decide the policy. You're the next generation. Definitely, ma'am. And I think this is going to be a, a, a great topic for more, uh, more researches in future. Those who are watching us can go into research because in India, especially, research is declining, unfortunately, especially in history that needs a push. So I think these topics are in need to be explored by students as well as scholars in India. Thank you so much. Well, hopefully, for, yeah. Hopefully, you can get some philanthropic organizations to fund this research on philanthropy. Indeed. <laughs> I think that would be a good thing. We, we, we can certainly hope if somebody can you know, take up this research if they want. There's no will actually in, in recent past. So we have to see 
if there's a will then there will be a way for such there researchers. are a lot of excellent younger scholars um uh, 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 uh younger professors who are doing fantastic research on questions of charity and trust. Um, and so it will come more into the circulation. But I think on the policy level also, research can be done. Uh, the question of uh, what constitutes charity, practices of charity, practices of philanthropy, they differ across cultures. Um, so uh, those sets of questions also still need to be explored. So quite seriously, you know, uh, Mellon Foundation, other foundation, they should be, you know, uh, Azim, she could fund this, she, you know, fund it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Uh, please fund it. <laughs> if they're watching us, please do so. Yeah, please fund it. <laughs> There's a dire need for that. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was truly an amazing evening. And I hope you enjoyed uh, it. Always yes. enjoy engaging with students. I always learn from your questions. It's it's a delight to have this kind of engagement. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for staying up in the evening. Uh, <laughs> would be with the time difference uh, from Toronto as well. Thank you, and thank you so much to everybody who joined us live. The video will be available. The lecture will be made available on YouTube in a while. So do share that with your friends, family, and research fellows. And I hope this will initiate a dialogue, especially on this area of study. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Ma'am, you have Thank a great you. day. Thank you.